Hi, everybody, and welcome to Detention. <laughs> so we are joined here today by Todd Vogt. Todd, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Todd is, um, I'm gonna give you a quick introduction um, of Todd before we jump into asking him a million stories about his very interesting life. Uh, Todd is joining us uh, from a different, a slightly different sport. We are, you are gonna get to hear me stumbling my way through row, rowing technology or terminology today. I think Chris is gonna do a little bit better as he describes himself as being rowing curious. Uh, but Todd started rowing in 1992 as a freshman in college at the University of Buffalo, which is possibly, is Buffalo maybe the only place that is grayer than Portland? I think that might be true. It's possible, it rains a lot there. Um, so University of Buffalo, he was immediately hooked on the sport, um, rode all four years of college and was team captain his senior year. Todd continued rowing in Buffalo while working on his master's degree in biochemistry. So we have many, many things to ask Todd about. Um, some of his racing highlights during that time included medaling at the U.S. National Championships from 1997 to 2000. In 2001, Todd and his wife moved to Portland and he has continued to row and train in the master's category while here. He started coaching part-time, but, um, but as all great coaches do, uh, he allowed coaching to take, take over his life full-time in 2009. Um, he's coached for Willamette University, University of Portland, and has done a four-year stint from 2013 to 2017, coaching the University of Wisconsin women's rowing team. Todd is currently the women's coach at Station L Rowing Club, which is a master's team here in Portland. Um, Todd noticed some unusual fatigue while training for a large rowing competition in 2017. Uh, not long thereafter, he was diagnosed with early onset Parkinson's in 2018 at the age of 44. Although initially and understandably devastated by the news, Todd shifted focus to training and racing as a Paralympic athlete, and he is currently training full-time to earn a spot on the mixed-gender four-person boat that will race at the Tokyo Paralympics. Um, Todd, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This is fun. It's, uh, hope this sounds fun. Um, I am super glad that you're here. We're going to get to talk about a bunch of uh, super nerdy physiological things. <laughs> um, but right. before we get into all that, uh, we actually have some race footage of Todd competing. Um, this is from a 2019 race, uh, the PR3 Mixed Cox 4. Um, apparently, rowing terminology is uh, difficult to say. Um, <laughs> this is from the 2019 World Rowing Cup in Poznan, Poland. And uh, Molly, uh, go ahead and roll that tape. Here we go. 300 meters to go, passing the 250 meters to go mark. America out in front. America are out right in front. And I think that gold medal looks like it's heading their way. The crew's coming into those red boys. 250 to go. Italy are the fastest boat on the course. Will they be able to stand to, to pick up the pace again like they had it at the start? They're looking to try and move back now. Yeah, and really moved on by the shouts of the Italian team here, right in front of our commentary position. You can hear them. The Italian, the Italian, Italian the shouts go. They've got the overlap yeah. on the Americans, but there's yeah. only about uh, 15 strokes to the line. France coming back into it as well. Those crews well ahead of the rest of the field. Italy have got the overlap. Which one are you going to go, Tom? The Americans. USA are going to take this race. Seat. Gold in the two, Yeah, two seats, so. Mixed Cox 4. Uh, two seats from the bottom. Italy take the silver medal. And France who take the bronze. What a very mature race, really, from the uh, American crew who uh, got away nicely. They didn't lead. But really just squeeze through the middle. And, there you uh, are! Did it when it mattered through the middle of the race there. There you the go. came back, cheered on by this crowd with a, uh, a good last 250. But it oh, yeah, everybody nice. looks spent. <laughs> and, uh, the French ended up coming in third. Nice. Just awesome. A confirmation there. The, uh... All right, I'm switching us back. Congratulations on that enormous win and for being called, um, what was that, a very mature race, which I feel like is very high praise from the European announcer there. Yeah, <laughs> that was great. Greg Searle, he's a, he's a two-time Olympic gold medalist, so I'll take that. So 
Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> why? Why was that? Why was he? Just, t- tell us about that call. Why would he describe that as a mature race? Uh, so the way it went down. So the Italians, we, kind of, we knew Italy would be fast off the line. So they they kind of based off the heat, our preliminary heat. So we just wanted to sort of match them, and then sort. So they took probably like a boat like lead off us at the first five hundred meters, at the first five hundred meter mark. And then we started moving through them. We were probably moved through them. We were probably even with them at about a thousand meters into the race. And we sort of steadily chugged them all away from them. And we probably had, at the 1500 meter mark, we probably had a little bit over uh, over a uh, boat length lead on them. And then they started sprinting like mad. So, I mean, it looks like they're making a massive move, but we can see them coming the whole time. And kind of like with, we were kind of just chugging along, even until maybe 250 meters ago, then we kicked it up a little bit just to sort of cover our lead. So I remember thinking to myself, like, this is going to sound crazy, but that race was awesome. Like, I remember thinking to myself at 1,500 meters ago, like, as long as we can just maintain this and not do anything too crazy, like what's called catch the crab, like, meaning have your core get caught in the water and massively disrupt your rhythm. As long as we didn't make any massive errors and we could kind of maintain our speed, we were going to be good to go. So I think that's why I said that. We kind of just, we didn't do anything dramatic. Like, we literally blasted away, we reeled them in. We, you know, stretched out a little bit of a lead, and then we, uh, you know, held on to our lead at the end when they came trying to make a move on us on the end. So, yeah. Is is there like a like is there like a typical kind of like unfolding of a rowing race? Like I know in in you, you watch bike racing, and like on a normal bike race, there's a there's an initial flurry of attacks, there's a breakaway, there's a long period of like kind of establishing the breakaway. The breakaway gets reeled in. Uh, is there something similar in rowing? Generally speaking, most people try to adhere to the strategy of get ahead, stay ahead. I think, like, given ro- rowing, I find is a little different from, you know, there's generally less, con- although having, having said this, there's generally less sort of conservation of your energy. You just sort of get ahead, hang on, and try to maybe sprint a little bit at the end. Although if you're some of the, like, really, really high-end crews who know they have really good speed, like the really, really top of the crews will go, will sort of be a little more conservative knowing they can maintain their speed through the middle of the race and reel people in. But most people try to, especially like the bigger boats, it depends on the boat class a little bit. So this is the thing about the rowing. There's all these different boat classes. There's like one person boats. Um, you know, there's there's two styles of rowing where you have people who skull where they row with both oars, you know, one in each hand and then you sweep row where like in that four person boat that race you to show, that's called sweep rowing, right? So each row has one oar. So like in an eight-person boat, the speed, it's hard to change speed in an eight-person boat. Just because of those eight people, it's going really fast. So the most um, effective strategy for an eight is just get ahead, stay ahead. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah, so that's so kind we, of the strategy. Maybe in like a single, you can be a little more conservative with your energy because it's easier to blow up in a single than just being used. So you want to be maybe a little more conservative than that. So. Very cool. So the way we usually start the show off um, is to is to ask everybody a very important question to like learn a little bit about them and their uh, and their history. And I don't even I, have a guess at your answer to this one, but um, but is this your first time in detention? Like, did you go to detention a lot as a kid in middle school and high school? Like, what's your detention experience, Todd? Um, <laughs> I was detention like a moderate amount, not a huge amount. But, okay. You know? I wasn't, a ter- I wasn't a terribly, like, bad kid, but, you know, uh, I wasn't an angel either, so. Cool. You fit I've right been, in, I've then. I've been in probably, like, let's say, more than five times, but less than, say, 20, so. Okay. Okay. All yeah, right. I feel All like right. that's exactly yeah. the right amount. <laughs> yeah. So Mo- Molly and I have some things to teach you about going to the detention. Yeah, Chris and I right. both are both on the heavier end of the detention. Oh, attendance. really? <laughs> <laughs> No, I want to know what you did. I guess what were you doing? You know, to get detention all the time. So, uh, I once made a not allowed gesture to the school librarian and served fifteen days of detention for that. Oh, nice. I ended up with more detentions than there were days of school on my senior in my senior year of high school because I dyed my hair blue, which was an out of uniform hair color, um, and then re dyed it navy blue, which was an in uniform hair color. Um, and, uh, yeah, and then was apparently back talking about my, about my detention, but oh, now okay. I have a normal hair color. <laughs> no, I, yeah, I feel like, you know, I don't know, it's sort of, uh, not angel, but, you know, I need to, uh, 
She like lived a little more. <laughs> Detention's not all it's cracked up to be. Except this one. Yeah. This one's great. <laughs> We're glad yeah, to yeah, have is, you here. <laughs> this is the best detention you want to be in. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Um, and you're you're a rower, so you know we know that like regardless of your evangelic status, like you know like we know that rowers like like to get after it. Oh yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, I, I shift into a, a slightly you know a slightly more serious question. Um, 2020 has been a tough year for everybody. Um, yeah. How have you been like? How have you handled the disruption in your coaching, in your training, in your life? Okay. How do I phrase this without? This sounds good. It sounds weird. But 2020, the whole thing with with coronavirus. Luckily, I have remained healthy, and my wife is healthy, so that's awesome. And my relatives all been healthy, so nobody's got sick. So which is great, but um, it's actually, I think, work, I guess the simplest way to say it is worked out a little bit towards my benefit. So uh, it's given me like, I really, my co- I have this coach who I started working with last fall, really serious, but we got really serious like last winter, beginning of like, maybe like last January. So anyways, the point of this is that with coronavirus, I haven't had, I haven't really been coached, I haven't been working very much. So I had all this extra time to train and sleep. So I just been, spending so much more time training and luckily like ever the one gym that i go to has pretty much been open the whole time so she has this cool altitude room um so i think it's actually helped me a lot because it's given me a lot more time to I, my fitness has improved a huge amount since last fall so uh so luck i think it's i guess i'm one of the few people who's probably benefited in this whole given this time so so i've just had more time to just basically, basically train, train without any distractions, distractions so, so. Along those lines, um, I really am fascinated with the uh, with the Paralympic goal, um, the uh, the goal of competing in Tokyo. Can you tell us a little bit about about the process that kind of got you here? What that what the training for that looks like? Like, what are you? What is the the time between now and then? What does that road look like for you? Okay, um, I'll step back and start to talk about the process just a little bit. So, just because it was kind of it was kind of interesting the way it worked for me. Um, so I, when I, I got diagnosed in August of 2018 with Parkinson's, so at first I didn't think I'd be really growing competitively anymore, although I did know about the Paralympic thing. So throughout the fall of 2018, I I tried to train, but it felt it just felt weird. Like I felt I was moving oddly. Like my rowing stroke is kind of like similar to a swimming stroke. It's like it's been ingrained in my body for like 15, 20 years. So suddenly, like I can't row. I couldn't row the way I normally felt like, which was like correct and you know efficient. So it took a long time to sort of. Get around that. So during the fall of 2018, you can see like here's my hand trembling. Um, I tried to regain some fitness and you know as best I could without being too demoralized. It seemed like it started to come around in the winter of 2019, the uh, last winter, and then it seemed like my fitness is pretty good. So I reached out to the coaches at, at U.S. Rowing uh, to, to figure out how to get one gets designated as a Paralympic athlete. So you have to get classified, which is the, which is sort of like a medical exam. And they determine how messed up you are, basically. So they run you through, like, uh, you know, all these sort of physical exams. Like, you know, they check all of your joints and have you stand up and sit down and row. And, it, you know, it's just like an hour or so. And then they, they, then they deem you, you know, mess, disabled enough to be classified as a Paralympic athlete. So with that, once I got – that was in late spring or early spring. So once I got designated as a Paralympic athlete from U.S. rowing, I contacted the coaches, sorry, I contacted the US Rowing coaches again and they and sent them some, they asked me to do some fitness tests on the machine, on the rowing machine, just test my fitness. So I sent them some results so they knew where my fitness was at. Based off of that, they invited me to the training camp uh, last summer in Boston. So that was the first step. So once I got designated, they, they had me do some fitness tests and got invited to the camp. And then at the camp, it's just a sort of training and selection camp. And from the camp, I ended up in the, eventually, at the end of 2000, the summer of 2019, I ended up in a two-person boat that raced at the World Championships. So, Amazing. Okay, so that was 2019. Then I came back to Portland. You know, it was basically at that point realizing, like, I had a, a, a shot to go to the Paralympics, so I've been training, you know, pretty seriously since then. So, um, okay, the next steps in the process. You want to know the next steps in the process? Yeah, yeah, I want to know all yeah. the steps in the process. <laughs> okay, so students... Uh, the, the, the major last thing is like we had a training camp right before the whole world sort of shut down. We had a training camp at the Olympic Training Center in Chula Vista in 
late February of 2019. That was all, that was like a bunch of guys, a bunch of women, just us training with the coaches. That was the last real thing. Then sort of everything sort of shut down. Um, I've just been training on my own. I had my own boat, which is like very convenient. So it didn't really, I didn't really even have to more, sort of miss a beat with training. So um, been training all summer. The last couple of months, they've been, the coaches have been assessing our fitness by having us do these monthly uh, fitness tests on the rowing machine. So we call them ERG tests. Like ERG is short for rowing. The rowing machine is also called an ergometer. You know, it's, it's short for ERG. Rowers lovingly refer to the rowing machine as the ERG. So we had to do some ERG tests. So in September and October, we had to submit a 6,000 meter, or we had to do a 6,000 meter ERG test. So you just sit down and do it. And then in November, we'll have to do two 2,000 meter ERG tests. 2,000 meters is the, this, that's the important one because that's the Olympic distance is 2,000 meters. So based off our times off the rowing machine for 2,000 meters, they're going to invite people to a selection camp in late, in mid January, early January. So that's the real important thing. So um, I should almost, almost certainly be invited to the training camp so, or to the selection camp in January, assuming, you know, assuming I don't get like injured or something crazy happens. So um, at the selection camp in January, that's at Chula Vista again in San Diego. The, the plan for now, assuming everything goes to plan, everything is possible to happen. So is that the selection will happen for Tokyo at that camp in, in mid January. So right now it's like really important time then, because that's like, uh, what two three months of training so I need to like, perform at my maximum so another, one other interesting thing too is that um, it's kind of interesting for the U.S. Uh, making the boat is like the crazy thing for the U.S. like the U.S. The US Paralympic at least the PR so in my category okay I step back and say so there's three Paralympic categories for rowing there's called PR1 PR1 is also used to be called just arms only so that's people who you know, they're strapped in basically all the way up to their waist, up to their almost sternum, and they can really only use their arms. There's PR2, which used to be called trunk arms, so they're strapped in up to their waist, and they can kind of pivot forward, and they can use their torso and their arms. And then I'm, I'm what's called PR3, which means you have the full use of your leg, trunks, and arms. So PR3 includes a lot of different disabilities, like I have Parkinson's disease, which is sort of odd. Uh, my partner last summer was a single leg amputee, uh, one of the girls in our training camp is blind. There's, um, let's see, a couple people like club feet. So, yeah, for the PR3, the boat that goes to Tokyo is this mixed cock four, mix of so two men, two women. Yeah, so that's the boat I'm trying to get into. That's so amazing. Um, so I've got a, a whole bunch of questions that come off of uh, that whole process thing. Um, one we've already chatted about beforehand, but just for the people who are watching, um, tell us like what a weekly, like a, like a weekly training load is like for you. And then to take it a step farther from, from where we talked about beforehand, how is that going to change between now and the selection? Okay. Um, typically I row, I work out about 15 to 20 hours a week. Um, basically it breaks down into two to three sessions a day. Uh, typically it's every morning I'm on the water, assuming weather's good or if not, I'm on the machine. So. Uh, meaning in my boat, or I'll eventually get into um, a, a two-person boat at some point too and do some sweep rowing, as I was mentioning before. Right now, I'm just in the single. So in the morning sessions, it's with my coach in the motorboat. And the sessions vary typically. So it's six sessions in the water. There's generally two or three hard sessions, typically two hard sessions out of the six. And then the other four sessions are just sort of um, like steady state aerobic uh, endurance training where you have some drills. The other sessions that are hard will be some sort of interval work, which could vary depending on the time of year from long intervals of, say, 10 minutes or more or more or short stuff of like 30 seconds to two minutes. So six mornings in the, uh, six mornings on the water. Then the afternoons, typically like I'll do three afternoons of just additional aerobic and uh, sort of cardiovascular training on the spin bike or on the concept two bike or maybe more on the rowing machine. Uh, lift weights a couple times a week. I do some yoga a couple times a week. So, yeah, that's kind Amazing. of the breakdown. And is that going to um, grow in volume between now and the selection camp? Will it grow in intensity? Like, how will it change over the course of the time between now and that? The volume will stay the same. The intensity will probably ratchet up. Like, we've already gone from having two hard workouts to having three or like two and, you know, two and a half hard workouts. So, and they'll probably shift gears and being more 
you know, I've been training for the last uh, September and October. The fitness tests were 6,000 meters, which is sort of unusual. That's not our traditional racing distance. 6,000 meters on the rowing machine. It took me 20 minutes and 45 seconds. So while well, 2,000 meters takes about, six, well, hopefully it'll take me like six minutes and 20 seconds on the machine. So it'll switch gears to being more focusing on the shorter distance stuff. So tell us, I, I think, you know, there's a lot. So, so testing is always a, a fraught topic uh, <laughs> yes. for endurance athletes everywhere, um, adored by coaches. Um, but uh, <laughs> oh, for sure, I feel the same way. As a coach, I would like, yeah, I was like, yes, test it. Let's see where everybody's at. Now I'm on the other side of the coin like, again, you know. So, so tell us, you know, I, I've, you know, let, rowers are sort of legendary for their ability to withstand discomfort. Um, tell us a little bit about what the experience of a 2,000 meter erg test is like. Okay. Um, honestly, I don't know. I mean, all endurance athletes, like having done, I've done a little triathlon. I used to run a lot, so I don't know. Rowers seem to have, don't have the market cornered on discomfort, you know, but it is particularly hard. I think the thing that's hard is that um, for rowers is that the rowing machine is it tells you exactly, the one thing that's sort of unique is that it, te it tells you how fast or slow you're going per stroke, as opposed to, say, a treadmill where you just set the time and you just need to stay on it, you know? I mean, I guess it's more akin. I guess cyclists, if you use the wow, if you use like your watt meter or whatever, and you could see how your wattage changed by every pedal stroke. So, okay. So, anyways, the 2,000 meter event, you know, test. So, an erg test. So, it's you break it down into your four 500 meter segments. So, you generally start off with a little burst at the start of the first 500 meters, like your first 15 strokes or so. You kind of take off and go hard to try to get into a good pace, find a rhythm. Um, I generally my sort of strategy is for the second 500 meters to focus on sort of like technical elements. Because I find like sometimes the second 500 meters is the hardest part because that's where you're starting to get pretty fatigued, but you're not really, you're so far from the finish that you can't start to ramp it up yet, you know? So you try to like maintain your consistent pacing through the second 500 meters. The third 500 meters is like, once you cross the thousand meter mark and you're halfway home, I generally feel like you can start to sort of see the light at the end of the tunnel a little bit. So you try to stay aggressive through the, th the third 500 meters. Then the, fourth, the last 500 meters, you know, wind it up and see what you got left in you. And, you know, hopefully there's still something there. So, I want yeah. everyone out I'm here to listen to this and apply it to their 400 freestyle time trial. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what I was trying to make. I was trying to make analogies to for, yeah, because what's a similar time? Because like I said, for me, it takes a good time for me. If I go 620, I'll be very happy. I'm likely to go probably 625. So what's a 400, say? 400 free time, so a good 400 free time. Somewhere in that in that area for for a lot of folks. Um, yeah, that's that's definitely, and it's a similar kind of event too. Like the 400 is, like the pacing structure that you're talking about would be how I yeah. told somebody to pace that 400, but breaking it up with like the first 100 and then the second 100, like just try to sit with it and then <laughs> third one then really try to ratchet it yeah. up, right? That's yeah, maybe like the last 50, bring it home, or like try to find a little more juice for the last 50. Exactly. Like Finish strong. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's great. Yeah, That's it's, always... like, it's, like, it's like running a mile too, I suppose. Yeah. You just get out on the track and, you know, knock out a mile, right? So. Yep. Yeah. I think absolutely. the thing that's challenging for a lot of athletes is the, is, is knowing that you have to leave a little room to build, but like, it's actually not, it's not a lot of room, yeah. you know, like you, you're building a very small amount of speed. Like it's not like you're starting off comfortably and finishing a sprint, but like yeah. you said, you can start off hard and finish harder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's just, yeah. Um, yeah, I think a lot of endurance athletes have that, you know, like I think that's the thing that takes so long to learn is like figuring out that very tight band of, of, of uh, effort. Yeah. I think that one other thing that's a difference for just on the road machine, not on the water, being on the water is probably more similar to running or swimming, but being on the machine is that it's really easy to go up way too hard and then blow up. And so, you know, on the, if you're running or on, in a boat or, or cycling, I'm sure, or swimming even, like you probably, you know, your pace varies, but you don't see it stroke by stroke in the water. You don't see that your and you don't see it like while you're running that your speed is going from, 10 miles an hour, nine miles an hour. You just kind of feel like maybe you're slowing down. But you're just kind of in the moment, you know, doing your thing. When you're on the machine, you can like see the speed go instantly go up and down. And it's like either, de and it's like demoralizing. You can just see yourself getting slower and slower every stroke, you know, as fatigue sorts of starts to set in. So 
I think that's the one thing that makes the machine tougher than than being in the boat or certainly in the boat. I and mean, when you're in, obviously, like when you're running or swimming or rowing, like if you've got competition and teammates with you, it makes it a lot easier. When you're on the machine, it's just you and the machine. <laughs> Just, just you and just sitting in your own sort of uh, juices, you know, staring at the number, you know, there's nobody with you, you know, so. Along those lines, um, I think a lot of what we talk about here is like the importance of, of self-talk and like psychology in sport. Um, we yeah. had a coach on a couple weeks ago who was talking about at how at like the very highest levels, the difference between elite athletes is often entirely their mental game uh, because everybody is really good at what they're doing. Um, can you tell us a little bit about like what the mental game involved with rowing is like and, and how your like mental game came together following your diagnosis as you shifted into par the Paralympic goals? Um, okay. So more generally speaking, um, the, yeah, the mental aspect, especially I'm going to go back and talk about the, er the rowing machine, the ERG. Mm -hmm. The ERG is much, like I said, for rowers is much more mental than being on the water. I'm, so you really have to have your sort of mental, your psychological strategy dialed in for on the machine. So, for example, last weekend I did a, I did a workout. It was uh, six 500 meter intervals, so six minute and a half intervals with a couple minutes of rest at like really fast pace. And I did it with this other this other athlete, this high school athlete who's pretty good, but um, he was similar in speed. So I had it. It was fun to do it alongside him. But in between, like I have a whole mantra. Like I just the things I tell myself is like between the intervals, I'm like feeling good. I got this. I just keep hammering that message into my head, like, feeling good. I got this. Feeling good. I got this. Like, it's almost like it, it, you just keep telling yourself, like, you're trying to fake it, you know, to, to let yourself know. So, yeah, and, and before the workouts, like, before the tests, like, it's funny um, having coached teams. Like, some, it's really interesting um, seeing how everybody does on test day. Like, some kids are nervous. Everybody's nervous. Like, everybody's anticipating it's going to hurt. But, like, some people can deal with it, and some people, like, freak out, you know? So I think, yeah, having like a strategy like on test day where you say like, I've done, one of the things I like to say is like, I've done the work. Well, hopefully I've done the work, but um, like I've done the work. And this is just like practice. Like the other thing too, it's nice to remind myself is like, I've done this before in practice, you know, just like in practice, I start hard and I finish and I finish strong. You know, I don't need to be Superman on, ra on race day, you know, like just like hard practice. Like these are all sort of the things that I tell myself like on test day, you know, that are, that are good to like calm me down. Like it's just like practice. You know, I've done the work. I'm ready for this, you know. So those are the type of things. So that helped on test day. So and during workout. And then, okay, um, so. Yeah, self-talk after diagnosis. Self-talk after diagnosis. So, um, okay. It's interesting. Um, it's been an evolution, I guess. So, like, it's been, a, it's been a process. I think it's still, like, it's still, a, it's still, it's still changing or evolving. So at first, like, First, it was hard because I, what I, so two of my main symptoms. So I have like tremor and I moved a little differently, and I'm also having some like new sound sense of fatigue that I never used to have. And that's like the hard thing for me to figure out. Sometimes I don't even feel necessarily it's like my body is weaker. I feel like it's my brain's perception of fatigue is just like it shuts me down earlier. Hmm. So I feel like I had to sort of like re. I, I don't know. For a while, it was like for a while, it was like refinding my limits, like. For example, even this workout that I did last weekend, my coach like gave me some numbers to hit. I remember like waking up in the morning when she told me the numbers and seeing the numbers. I remember thinking, to myself, I haven't seen these numbers in five years. So I actually like went as fast as she wanted, if not a little faster. But the whole time, I, the, you know, I remember before the workout thinking, how am I going to do this? I haven't seen this like since way before pre, you know, pre Parkinson. So I don't know. Part of it is like trying to push beyond what I think I'm capable of now. I think that's part of the Parkinson's thing is sort of reinventing my, you know, finding, refining my limits. You know, I think like what I feel like sometimes is I can only do slower. I can, I'm slower than I think I am. But when then in reality, I'm actually faster. I'm sorry. I'm not making a whole lot of sense, but it's been, it's been an interesting, like refining my limits. So knowing how my body feels. So yeah, like last Saturday was interesting. She, like, like I said, she gave me some times to, for my intervals that I, and I remember seeing them initially when she told me like a day or two before thinking there's no way I can do this. Like this is way beyond my capability. And then I remember I warmed up and I was like, all right, worst case scenario, I'll do the first one and the first 500 meters and I'll blow up, you know? And I just, and I nailed it. And I remember thinking like after I got, I remember like three intervals into it, I, I it felt like sustainable. I was like, I'm going to finish this. I'm going to finish strong. 
So I remember getting done, like, I, this has happened several times this fall, especially, where we've done this testing, like, the, the two six dollars a meter tests, like, were, like, 40 seconds faster than it was, like, in the spring. So, like, a huge jump, like, a 3% performance jump. So, yeah, I just remember thinking to myself, like, I, I can go faster than I think I can. So, I don't know. I'm being sort of not clear about this, but. No, definitely. Um, it is, I mean, you know, we, uh, I think all of us have, all of us experience some kind of adversity like this at some point, whether it, uh, whether it's you know, Parkinson's, um, incredibly in life or something else. But like, at, by this point, is it something, you know, that has, has it, has it helped you as an athlete? Has it changed um, you in some way? Uh, let me see. I don't know. If it's, yeah. I don't know. That's a good question, actually. Somebody asked me that a couple days ago. So, well, clearly there's one thing that's, that, that, that's obviously that's different is that um, it gives me this opportunity to, to, you know, to train at this, to, to try to train to go to the Paralympics and represent the country. Like, okay, I was a pretty good rower after college, but, you know, I was not going to be going to Olympics. And I was, and I was a good master's rower. I was like a really competitive master's rower, but there's a big difference. You know, this is like, gives me an opportunity, like, to do something really special set up. Yeah. Which is which is kind of crazy, and so I have this disease, I guess you could say, this condition that is horrible in a lot of ways, and it like dominates my life like all the time, like it dominates like pretty much everything I do. It's it's inescapable, you know, from like the moment I wake up. But at the same time, it gets me, it allows me to like, I like spent the last summer like traveling around Europe racing for the U.S., you know, which is super cool, and maybe go to Tokyo if I can get you know get my stuff together. So. So I had that, that. So I guess that's the good part of it too. So, and there are maybe some other things too. And you know, this is what I was saying yesterday, and uh, talked to somebody else. Is that okay? I have a, It's going to get worse. You know, that's the way it goes with a degenerative disease. So, so I, and hopefully, I try to sort of make me. It hopefully it gets me to sort of appreciate the moment that I'm in now. So, yeah, because I keep telling myself like, okay, this is this is the best I'm going to be is like right now. So let's just like try to appreciate this moment like. You know, taking my dog for a walk or having dinner with my wife or something like that. So, you know, getting a little more spiritual, I guess you'd say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think that that's. Yeah, I think a lot of people, uh, a lot of people watching or listening, you know, um, one reason why this is like a great gift for us to talk to you is that it allows people to imagine. Okay, what would what would I do in this particular situation? Yeah. Something that I've thought recently too that's maybe more relevant to everybody who, to anybody who may be watching this is that sometimes like, okay, I'm training a lot. Like there are a lot of days where I wake up and I feel not great. Like my back is sore, I'm tired, I'd rather just stay in bed, I'd rather not just go out into the rain and roast more. But then I realize like, I'm doing this because it's a really cool opportunity, you know? I, I'm not gonna have this opportunity maybe in two, three, four years. So like, I try to keep that in mind. Like, this is what Parkinson's given me. So, so even when like the days when I'm feeling like tired and sore, realize it's part of this like bigger, cool project. So, yeah. What's the vibe it at the? Me, like, appreciate my training a little more. Yeah, I bet. Um, yeah. What are the? Not... What is the the vibe like at races? Is it like a? Is it a big party scene? Is it something that like? Tell me how it's different from from other like race environments you've been in. Um, let's see. So, yeah, I'm trying to compare it, I guess, to, it's probably less, it's probably less of a party than, I, you know, I, so back in like 08, 09, I hurt my back like 15 years ago. I had, like, I had a, a bulging disc, which is very common for rowers. Mm -hmm. And so I started swimming. So I couldn't row. The only thing I could do was swim. So I started swimming. Then I could play. Then I could run again. So for like two years, I did try, I did just like a bunch of sprint triathlons. So, <laughs> which is awesome. I really loved it too. It was fun. So, um, Anyways, compared to like say a running race, and I used to run all, all the time, which is harder for me to do now, but so I've done a lot of running races too. So I'd have to say running races and like triathlons are much more of like a much more of a fun environment. It seems like people have a lot more fun and are more chatty. Road races, it seems like they're a little more um, more serious and like stressful, you know. So I don't know. I don't know why. I guess, but I can see it. maybe it's because like people get our people are probably like are less, like, you have your built-in, you have your teammates, which you're pretty tightly bonded to, who you've been, like, rowing with this group, like, your eight other rowers, so, I don't know, maybe it sort of informs, like, um, a little more us-versus-them mentality sometimes, so, 
as opposed to like running races where everybody's just out there, you know. So, how, how long how, how long are the competitions? Like, I know there's a big I know there's a, a big range, but um, yes. like, what is the like the majority of rowing races? Like, how long the how long how many elapsed minutes are you are you rowing for? All right, good question. Uh, so this is a good question. It depends. There is a lot of variety. I'll break it maybe down to the three categories. So um, the Olympic distance is 2,000 meters. And so that varies the time distance. It depends on, like, if you're if you're in a men's eight, for example, a good men's eight, you're probably going to six minutes. For Olympic standard for a men's eight is, like, 520. Like, a good collegiate eight is maybe, like, six minutes. Um, a good collegiate women's eight is probably, like, 630. So... That's a women's day, but like a single on the other hand, like a women's single may go eight minutes. So that's where 2,000 meters. Um, masters on the other hand, like the masters distance, masters have like their whole summer circuit racing circuit take place in the, during the summer. Like masters national championship is typically in like August, I think it's typical. So masters race a thousand meters, which is generally like three to four minutes, depending on the boat class and boat type and gender. Um, then in the fall, there's this whole different other race type. It's called a head race, head meaning it derives from like, I think it's an old English term. So if you typically like what in the 19th century in England, when they ran these races, if you won the race, you were called the head of the river. So um, they have these races, probably the most well-known of any of them is called what's called the head of the Charles. And the Charles River runs through Boston right by Harvard. So head races typically are approximately 5,000 meters, but it depends on the body of water. Uh, so they, they use whatever, if it's the river is 4,000, like the head of the Charles, for example, is 4,702 meters. So, because that's the distance that, like, works on that body of water. Like, that's what they've so got. Typically, <laughs> like, they range from, say, 4,000 to 6,000 meters, which the head of the Charles, you race against the current. So it takes, like, in a men's aid, it takes, like, 17 minutes, you know? So, and, yeah, and they run the, also the head races, like, 2,000-meter races and 1,000-meter races are run, like, swim meets, like, track meets or, like, swim meets, you know? You'll have six boats or five boats or how many boats lined up side by side. They say, attention, go. First boat across the line wins. In head race, they run them in like a time trial format now. Because they can't, because you know, it's like 5,000 meters on a river. You can't have, and those races have a lot of entries typically. You can't have like 100 boats side by side going down for 5,000 meters down the river. So they'll run them one at a time with like 20 second intervals. So, you know, the first boat will go off, the second boat will be 20 seconds behind it, the third boat 20 seconds behind that, and then you're just racing against, against the clock primarily. But there is fun, like, if you try to, the strategy is basically to hold off the boat behind you and catch as many boats in front of you, so. Because if you're catching boats in front of you, you clearly are doing pretty darn well, so. Mm -hmm. So those are the, that's pretty much boils down to those two, those three types of racing, so. And do people typically do, like, do they specialize in one style of race? Like, do they specialize in one boat size? Do they specialize as one type of rower? Or do you move throughout your career into different specialties? That's a good question, actually. Um, so I would say most people in the U.S., at least, in Europe, it's different. Most people in the U.S., most people start what's called sweeper rowing, like with one oar. Because typically, most people start rowing in high school or college, and it's just easier to start, like, in an eight-person boat. Mm -hmm. An eight-person boat is like a bathtub. It's like really easy to train. It's not going to flip. You know, it's very balanced. So it's easy to put a lot of people out, especially if you have like a large college or high school team. The easiest way to get like, you know, a ton of people out is put them in eights. So most people learn to sweep row at the beginning. In Europe, it's the other way around. Most people learn to skull. So I just mostly like practically speaking, like, like I said, in the U.S., it's hard to get out and say 30 singles. Like a single is a one-person boat. Yeah, uh, so there's two disciplines. So that's sweep rowing. That's how I started rowing. Sweep rowing in college, right? I learned to sweep row. Then I did. I only rowed in sweep boats. So like eight person boats, four person boats, and two person boats, with just one or each. And then eventually, after like, after I got out of college, mostly due to, for practical reasons, I, I taught myself to skull, which is what where each rower has one or so. Sculling is generally viewed as the more um, technically challenging aspect of the two uh, sort of disciplines. Because especially like a single, like a one-person boat is viewed as being very technically demanding. A single is oftentimes like you can put smaller people who are physically smaller but more technically proficient in a single, and they'll be faster than people who are bigger than and stronger than them. Mm -hmm. As contrasted to an eight, an eight is so fast, it's it's so big and stable. An eight is an eight-person boat is almost like an ergometer to a certain extent. It's just pretty much boils down to it's not 100 percent, but it pretty much boils down to physiology and you know how much horsepower you can generate. So. With a little bit of finesse, with a touch of finesse. 
So I did not even think about the yes. possibility of a boat flipping as something and <laughs> something to worry yeah. about. Now I'm like, I just flipped in my single last week. Actually, I hit a log. It hit my work. Oh like, no! I haven't flipped in like two. I haven't flipped in like two years. But it was a really nice day. It was like seven. It was like one of the warm sunny days recently. Good. So it was like 65 degrees and sunny, and I was like close to the boathouse. I just there's this one log that I just didn't see. It was like couple feet long, you know, six inch diameter, and just tapped, and it just nailed my blade of my oar right as I was coming up to take another stroke and just knocked my oar over and I just sort of went oh, over. No. Where is the yeah, boathouse in Portland? In. Where is the boathouse here? Is it on the Willamette, on the Columbia? Uh, the place I wrote out is called Portland Boat Club. It's, it's underneath the Saudi Island Bridge. It's on the Multnomah Channel. Oh, cool. Awesome. Oh, cool. So that's like, that's a pretty small boathouse. The place I coach is called Station El Road Club. That's my Omni, essentially. It's like right near, um, it's right near just, uh, so that'd be just south of the Tillicum Bridge, between like Ross Island and Tillicum Bridge. Great. That's like probably the biggest boat club in town. They have a really large high school program there. And the club that I'm coaching at has a really large master's women and men's team. So cool. there are a couple other teams too. There's one by Oaks Park. There's a high school team in a Mac. There's a pretty large high school team there. And in Lake Oswego, there's a smaller high school and master team too. So there are a few teams in town, but. Awesome. I wrote the reason I like to row where I row now is that uh, I mean I, I use I rode my one person boat it's like it's really you, it's only like six inches off the water the size of the boat you know so it's designed for flat water the multi-channel channel like is great like I can pretty much row every day like the water is calm and it, I although today I couldn't row it was too windy and rainy but mm -hmm. that's unusual so um, speaking speaking of coaching. Um, you know, so you, you've you've uh, you've spent a lot of your, your career coaching. Um, what um, at every sport, I feel like um, there's sort of things that all coaches do that are similar, and then every sport has like its unique challenges. Um, what are the unique um, coaching challenges that rowing presents? Okay, so uh, one thing I don't know I don't know how this compares to like track and field or triathlon, but sometimes like especially. As a rowing coach, like there's a lot of like external things you have to deal with. As a rowing coach, like we you drive like a little small boat or boat alongside the rowers when you're at practice, right? So you know you need to necessarily you need to, the skills you need as a rowing coach are like fiberglass repair. The boats are <laughs> the boats are relatively are pretty delicate. So especially in a river like Portland, like it's really easy to you know knock your the little fin off your boat. So you need to you know how to do like carbon fiber fiberglass repair to keep the boats functional. You need to know how to do like small engine repair to keep the motorboat running, you know. And then I think that I'm kind of joking a little bit. I think the challenge for rowing coaches, and I don't know if this is the same for track and field, but you're, it's it's one thing when you row, you generate a lot of heat, so you stay like you can pretty much row in any condition, assuming like similar to running, like you generate a lot of heat as long as you if you got some base layers on, you can row when it's 40 degrees in rain. With coaching, on the other hand, you're just sitting there in the motorboat in this little small aluminum motorboat, just like in the rain when it's 40 degrees, it's, it's kind of, mis you know, you freeze your butt off and you're soaked. So it's like the physical, that's what I think is the physical chance. This is what I say, like, mm -hmm. um, I would, uh, in Wisconsin, I would be, go and work out in the volleyball court. Like sometimes I was like, oh man, to be a volleyball coach in the gym where all you have is some volleyball to the net that all you have to deal with, you know, you don't have to transport your equipment on a giant trailer and then hope it doesn't break and then be outside for five hours in the rain, you know, so. Anyways, Life is good for the indoor challenge. sports. <laughs> what is that? Life is good for the indoor sports. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking like swim coaches. You, yeah, you stand on the deck, right? So. Standing on deck is great, but open water coaching in the rain, like we don't have any cool boats. We just stand out there. It's hard. <laughs> yeah. So. Humidity, humidity and dehydration is a problem for swim coaches indoors. Oh, yeah, yeah. that's a good point. <laughs> that's a good point. Yeah. Stand up and get the spins. Like, yeah, exactly. You're like, down, you're like down near the water talking to an athlete. Stand up too fast, and you're like, oh. <laughs> yeah. I'm going I think the other pool. challenge that rowing coaches have, which is probably more similar to swimming coaches, is that at least on like the collegiate and sometimes the high school level is that you practice at like 6 in the morning, 5 in the morning, you know, yep. just, especially at the collegiate level just to manage, because that's the only way you can get like 60 high school or 60 college kids together is by practicing at six in the morning. So, you know, you're like sleep deprived as well. So, which I'm guessing like, I think that's a sense that like a lot of like uh, swimming teams do too, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Swim, swim teams, you're, you're usually two a day, like five in the morning and then usually like five in the evening. You do like yeah, one yeah. hour in the yeah. morning, two hours in the evening. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, exactly. Like what most swimmers grew up doing. Yeah, that's brutal, that's hardcore. 
So we still have a bunch of questions for you, but we have a few questions in chat as well. So I want to take a okay. second and, uh, and make sure that we get to some of those. First one, there's a question about how many boats you have. How many boats do you have? Um, well, personally, I just have one. Okay. Uh, I just have my one person boat. But um, having said that, like, I, I, like um, the team that I coach for, like, I don't actually even know. I mean, we have probably like six or six or eight eight person boats, probably four four person boats, and a bunch of two person boats. And now with COVID, they bought a whole bunch of singles. They probably have like hmm. twenty singles as well. Wow. Like a typical college team, depending on how, like, a Division One women's college team will have ten eights. You know, maybe five or six fours, and then some two-person boats, training boats, and maybe some stuff interspersed in there. So, so the boats yeah, are usually I mean, owned by the, the club. Was that the boats are usually owned by the club or the team or the yeah, boathouse? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, cool. Unless it's like my private, it's my private boat, so mm -hmm. I have my own single. So, yeah, the, the equipment is not inexpensive. So, I bet you know it's like a single, a, a nice racing single is like ten grand, brand new. Okay. A new eight-person boat is like, depending on the manufacturer, is probably like forty grand, thirty grand. So wow, it's a couple so. bikes. <laughs> yeah, definitely, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so. um, and... The uh, the favorite question of ev of endurance athletes everywhere: um, <laughs> What do you eat before race? Oh, nice! I was waiting for some food talk. So yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I don't know. I mean, I have I have a bit of a, like an iron stomach, so I can pretty much eat anything. I've I've learned uh, so over the years. So typically, like my typical sort of go-to morning food is I make overnight oats. You know, so I have like some nuts and like pecans and walnuts, some milk, some oatmeal, some berries in there, maple syrup, something like that. That's like my I have like a big bowl of that like every morning and like a cup of coffee and then a whole bunch of water. That's my sort of morning breakfast. You know, so. What yeah. does nutrition look like throughout the race? Well, throughout the race, like if it's a two thousand meter race, you just you just um, I mean you'll fuel before. Okay, I should step back and say like and when you're on the water race, you generally like launch your equipment like an hour before your race starts, mm. just because like the logistics of moving the boat around. So you got to kind of like time things up. So depending on the time of day. So if it's like a morning race, you just eat a big breakfast. Maybe you take like a electrolyte or like something like you know whatever your electrolyte and you know sugar beverages of choice out in the water with you and then you just like sit that or maybe like i'm a big fan of like the cliff shop locks too so i might oh, yeah. take some of those out in the boat with me and just have a few of those while i'm out there warming up mm -hmm. yeah. have you had the new fruit punch ones i just had them for the first time they're amazing <laughs> no i'll they're try so, it you've got to try them they're, sure, so, good. Yeah, they're so. so good so you're yeah. so so you have to like deal with the beads you launch and then like you're out on the water for an hour or more before your race begins? Yeah, typically. That's pretty, you know, me, it, very, it depends on the venue as well a little bit. So if it's a really, like, really tightly organized venue, like where everything's really close by, maybe 30 minutes, but mm -hmm. that's pushing it. Like, because it takes a little bit. You got to carry the boat down. Okay, let's really walk it through. So like, you stay from where the, your rack, where you're on the corner of a park. It takes you 10 minutes to stay, walk the boat to the water, put your oars in, you know, strap in, shove off navigate through the boats on the shore. So then it takes probably like, you have a warm up sequence, which will take a couple minutes. And then you'll row for a little bit. Then you'll probably take a couple like 10 stroke first, you know, to sort of rev things up. And then you gotta like maneuver near the starting line uh, and then like sort of get yourself situated on the starting block. So that whole thing probably takes like realistically, like if you push it, you maybe 30 minutes is like, if you're hauling buns, you can get it done in 30 minutes. 40 minutes is, not bad like typically it depends who it is like if it's a high school crew who's not super proficient you might want to go like an hour and 20 minutes to make sure they can get there on time you know so but if it's like you know if it's like a one person boat in a single and they're pretty skilled like okay maybe they can do 40 minutes it's probably fine they can like get right in the boat get right on the warm-up and get right in the start and then they can minimize the time out there so and hopefully you don't have to pee while you're out there so the, I have been thinking about career. that the whole time. <laughs> I was like, what if you have yeah, to pee? No, it happens, like, it happens all, all the time, yeah. I mean, I've peed in the bottle at the re at restart, you know, several times before, so. You would have to, yeah. So for, like, the head races, for example, like, not to go on this too long, the head races, like, a sprint race, you only have, if you say you're in the park and you're by the finish line, you have 2,000 meters to get up there. Okay, not a huge distance. It might take you 15 minutes to paddle up there. But, like, with a head race, if you start by the finish line, you've got to paddle like 
for 5,000 meters or so all the way to the start line. So you might have to ra- you might have to launch like an hour and a half before oh the race God. starts. So, especially like this big race in Boston called Headley Charles, which is a huge race. Like people come in yeah. from all over the world. There's like so many boats in the starting area that marshalling up the boats takes forever. So, yeah. We have one so more question. Easy. What? Yeah, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, like, it's a like you have to plan more for your warm up eating than you do for your in competition. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, seriously. Huh. Um, uh, one more question in chat that I think is a very good transition to a topic that we wanted to know more about, um, and this is from an anonymous uh, a question asker who wants to know if you are aware. Um, I'm sorry, if you are a regular attendee at Amy VT's online yoga class uh, here at the Endurance School on Wednesday mornings. <laughs> no, I haven't. What, what time? Is, what's the deal with it? 6.30 a.m. on Wednesdays right. and 7 a.m. Oh, on sweet. Sundays. Um, coached okay. by the one and only Amy Van Tassel. Um, excellent yoga and uh, probably the Internet's best dance party midway through. Um, sweet. And uh, and that, that works, really like, training wise too. Yeah, that would work Wednesday morning. So oh, that's and perfect. That's that perfect. And then pop and then jump in my boat. So oh, awesome. Um, yeah. But yeah, we were interested in like what role yoga plays in your training. Um, how did you how did you find it and and how does it how does it help to support your training? How does it fit into your life? All of that. Um, I don't know. I don't know how it came. Out. I think my wife like introduced me to yoga way back when, maybe fifteen years ago or so. I went to some class and. I remember, you know, trying to do like a pigeon pose and like almost thinking I was going to die or something like that, you know, initially way back when. But um, I, I'm older. I mean, I'm 46 years old, so I'm not 25 anymore. So I feel like I, you need to pay attention. I need to like try to, you know, do what I can to sort of mitigate injuries and things like that. So, yeah, that's what that sort, sort of falls in the, uh, the, the purpose for it. So. Nice. Um, two-parter. One um, from uh, Cher Vasquez in chat uh, asking about the um, uh, the rowing the rowing machine the erg machines that she wanted to know are they basically the same rowing machines that you'll see at like most gyms? Oh, absolutely. Well, there's only there's really like two or three manufacturers of rowing machines. There's really only two that you'll see. There's the Concept Two, which is everywhere. That's like the most common one. That's used in like every boat house. Mm-hmm. It's used in every cross class. And it's used in pretty much every gym as well. So Concept2 is sort of the industry standard. The other one that's very commonly seen is what's called the water rower. That's like, or if you go to an Orange Theory class, you use those. They're very similar. Like, they feel pretty similar. The monitors look pretty similar. Um, Concept2 is, is Concept2 has maybe more of a similar to feel to being on the water, the way that the chain picks up, you know, with the flywheel. It has, like, a really sophisticated monitor. So that's kind of the one that most like on the water rowers are using concept too and that's like the one you'll see everywhere and that's that's pretty much everything that like that, that's pretty those are pretty there are some other ones out there but if you go to any gym across a gym or a boathouse you'll see a concept too Very cool. um and then uh sort of my training question that comes off of that one is um you know we as triathletes and cyclists and runners um we are always talking about different energy systems and different physiologies um Molly and I have been doing a lot of uh, talk about lactate physiology recently with our oh. athletes. And um, I was wondering what, like to what degree do rowing coaches like talk about that same kind of thing, about different energy systems, do you do lactate testing? Like, like give us a little run through of kind of the training jargon that we might hear when athletes are talking about rowing workouts. Okay. It depends on the level. Okay, I don't want to generalize here, but I would say as a whole, rowing coaches probably talk about energy systems less than other coaches do. I think there's, because there's a lot more going on that rowing coaches, I, this is my sense, because there's so much more going on with equipment and the technical aspects as well, that there's less, I think, emphasis on energy systems. Although the, the, the terms you might hear, probably the one that you hear over and over again is steady state. Like steady state is probably one of the most commonly used terms in like rowing physiology it just means like steady state meaning a lower stroke rate the one thing you can do with the rowing machines you can you can um monitor your stroke rate your strokes per minute which generally will you know sort of um put you in the correct sort of intensity that you want so it'll be a lower stroke rate like 18 strokes a minute 20 strokes a minute as opposed to a racing cadence of like 32. so steady state is like that's what people do tons of as rowers like that's probably you know for most rowers like steady state training is 
three quarters or more of their trading. And so rowers, most rowers understand the term steady state. That's like a pretty heavily used term. But then beyond that, like you'll hear maybe in a typical boat house, you hear talk of like, you know, everybody has intervals, but you'll, the physiology terms you hear will be like, you'll rarely hear like, it depends on the system. You might hear like anaerobic threshold and lactate training or alactic or like transportation. Like those are the terms. And some people use other terminology like UT1, like utilization level one or utilization level two. But I think this is my perception is that it's it's less there's less talk of physiology amongst the rowers. So it's generally broken down into steady state, short interval, long interval. So as presented to the rowers by the coaches. So there's maybe a little and, simplification. And how do you design like as a coach, how do you design a particular session? Like what like how do you kind of break it down into what you're trying to accomplish? Okay. That's a good question. Um Assuming you're on the water, so you're on the water session. So, if say, let's say today is the steady state day, and we can break take it as two typical workouts, like a steady state day and an interval workout. The warm ups might be identical. You launch, you generally, if you say like an eight person boat, you'll generally like have four people row for about five minutes or so, and take them through like a, a, a little progression to sort of break the stroke down from a very short part of the stroke to a full stroke, like a little technical progression. Have the other half of the boat do it have them row together in like a lower cadence, lower intent, the entire boat row together in a lower cadence, lower intensity. And then depending on what your technical focus is, you'll probably do some sort of technical drills, whether it's like pausing at various places in the stroke or some balance drills. And then at some point during the warm up, you'll, depending, this is where it might vary. If it's a steady state workout, you might just get in the, this part might, what I just described, like rowing by part of the boat and doing the technical drills might take 10 minutes or so, 10 to 15 minutes, depending. That's how crazy you want to go with that. After that 10 to 15 minutes, if it's a steady state workout, endurance workout, you probably just get right into it at that point. So like a st typical steady state workout, say it's four by 15 minutes, for example, four or 15 minute in intervals. And then, and it can depend on the coach. It'll depend on like how crazy they want to get. Like they might just have you row 15 minutes at stroke rate 20, you know, and people, and you, and you can monitor the intensity. Like I wear a heart rate monitor, so I can monitor my intensity you know, I'm making sure I'm right about 115, 120 beats a minute, wherever I want to be. You can also monitor your speed as well. Like you know, there's a, there's a GPS in the boat. So, and then you can get great, you can get more um, elaborate with steady state workouts. For example, if you're doing four, 15, like four, 15 minute chunks of work, you can get sophisticated. You could say the first five minutes are going to be at stroke rate 16. The next five minutes will be at stroke rate 18. The next stroke, the next five minutes will be at 20. Just if for nothing else to break up some of the monotony, or you can even say like, we're gonna do 15, four by 15 minutes, the, every 15 minutes, like, you know, within those 15 minute chunks of work, <clears throat> every four minutes, we're gonna do one minute of a drill. And that'll break up the same thing. It'll break up a little bit of the monotony and it'll give you a little bit of technical, like uh, emphasis as well. So that's how like, that's a pretty standard steady state workout there. And you guys, where'd you guys go? There you go. We got your mohawk just for a second. Um, okay. uh, um, an interval workout, the only thing that would change with an interval workout is you do the partial boat rowing warm up, you do the technical drills, and then you take a few, you probably take another five minutes where you have everybody rowing together and taking some high intensity bursts, and then you start your workout. So, say it would be 6,000 meter intervals, then you do your 6,000 meter intervals or whatever prescribed stroke rate it is, and take your rest, and then a little bit of cool down session and take it in. So. Yeah. And is technique something that you work on throughout the year or is there, are there specific phases or specific parts of your career where that's, it's more technique heavy or is it always part of the training that you do? It's, I mean, it's always part of what you're doing. Um, Great. I mean, more <laughs> like swimmers. It's like, it, it's, yep. you can't get away. Like that's, there's basically two things you need to do to be maybe three, I like to say, but clearly two things you need to go fast. You need to have like a pretty good engine. You need to be technically proficient. You know, you can't get around it. You can't get around the technical aspect of it. So, a lot of times coaches will have like a technical progression throughout the year though. Like at the beginning of the season, like in a collegiate season in the spring, at the beginning of the season, they'll maybe focus on like your body mechanics. And then as like spring, as the season evolves, they'll focus on like your blade work, you know? So. Very cool. Awesome. Well, uh, Todd, this hour has absolutely flown by. Seriously. Uh, totally. I, was surprised. Yeah. I know. Me too. I just looked up. I was like, Oh my God. Um, <laughs> but, uh, this was awesome. Uh, we would love to have you back sometime to talk more, especially as you get farther into the selection period. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, because uh, I think we got through maybe about half the questions that Molly and I prepared. Sure. Uh, 
Sure. Um, and um, this was uh, this was really really cool. Uh, we hey. have um, we end up mostly kind of stuck in the swim bike run um, uh, kind of area, and it is really great to have somebody that is from a different sport and to hear about the differences and the similarities. So thank you hey. so much for coming on. Yeah, I like talking about like because I think there's there's so, there are a lot of similarities between the, the disciplines, you know, running, cycling, swimming, rowing, they all have a lot of things that are similar, in, like in the training, and so it's kind of cool, too. Here, I just happen to have this, like, sitting next to my, I'm in my kitchen table, so yes. I didn't oh, see this. right on. Oh, that's oh, cool. awesome. Whoa. Congratulations. That's a world record right. certificate. Like, Concept, <laughs> Concept 2 keeps records for, has, Concept 2 has, like, their rec world records for, like, every distance and every age group, so... Like you could get, you know, so it's not, so it's like, I had this really, so it's a 6,000 meter men, 40 to 49 who are Paralympic athletes. There's probably like five people in that category in the world. Hey, I yeah. doubt that. Hey. I don't have any world yeah. records and yeah. I do a lot yeah. of things with very few people around. <laughs> yeah. I bet maybe swimming's like that. Cause you could say like, you know, women, 40, 49, hundred meters, right. Something like that, you know, or 25, meters, I don't know. You could break it up like it's so. Yeah. It's possible. You're, you are our first world record holder in detention. I think that's true. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That's, that's true. Funny. Uh, um, well, thank you for joining. This has been this has just been awesome. Uh, we really appreciate it. And please keep fun. us informed about how the how the progress towards Tokyo goes. Uh, there's lots of talk cool. about your official fan club forming in um, in chat. So uh, so yeah, I think there are a bunch of people who are who are cheering you on. Um, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this where is this was awesome. Where can people uh, follow your? Where can people follow your process? Oh, great question. Um, I post like things on Instagram and uh, Facebook. So my Facebook is just my name, Todd Bo. On Instagram, it's Engine Room Twenty Three. Okay. So Perfect. engine Engine Room is a rowing term. So, and so in an eight-person boat, the four seats in the middle of the boat are just your your biggest, fittest, strongest guys who don't row very well necessarily. <laughs> They're your engine room. So that's kind of where the name comes from. Awesome. Twenty Three. You're Michael Jordan fan. Exactly. Yeah, got it. <laughs> Great. Engine Room 23. All right, everybody, you heard it. That is where you can follow uh, Todd on Instagram. Uh, follow him on Facebook. And, uh, yeah, we will uh, have him back on as we uh, learn more about uh, rowing towards Tokyo 2021. Thank In you. the meantime, make sure you come back and join us tomorrow morning for Yoga with Amy VT tomorrow at 6.30 a.m. live on the Endurance School. Uh, we'll be back for a group Zwift ride on Thursday, Swim Fit on Friday. Um, no yoga on Sunday this week because Chris and VT are headed to Cedar City to ride their gravel bikes. Um, but we will be seeing you again soon. And Todd, please keep us updated about, about your progress. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Bye, guys. <laughs>